so much, uh, Amy and Brian, for putting this conference together. I've been excited uh, to participate since almost a year, especially since, for me at least, was my first non-Zoom conference. It is my first non-Zoom conference since quite a while, and so I'm really, really happy to be here um, in our home university and to be able to talk about New Orleans right here in Munich. So thanks for for um, having me participate in that and for inviting all these uh, wonderful people and uh, researchers. And thanks you all for being here and listening to our talks today. So I'm, I'm the historian on board, which is why um, yeah, we're gonna start uh, with a look back uh, into the uh, early 20th century and the late 19th, even early 19th century at some stage. Um, <clears throat> It would be a crying shame and disgrace if America should permit one of the very greatest of its historical monuments to pass away, a reader of the New Orleans Times Picayune exclaimed in 1916. Located in the French Quarter, the St. Louis Hotel, one of the city's luxury hotels and key commercial exchanges of the antebellum era, was about to be demolished. This engendered a flurry of preservationist initiatives and activities destined to save the old structure from the wrecking ball, but to no avail. Raising and starting afresh has always been a strong rival to preserving, especially in the United States, that self-declared nation of futurity, to use the words of John L. O'Sullivan. As Margaret Mead, the anthrop anthropologist, mused in a 1978 interview with the American Preservation Magazine, and I quote her, I think preservation is another of the many ways we're beginning to compensate for ruthlessness towards the past, this country's past. We are ruthless towards the old, tearing down, destroying, it does have an effect. The destruction of things that are familiar and important causes great anxiety in people, end quote. Using the St. Louis Hotel as a lens, my paper will shed light on the beginnings of historic preservation in New Orleans. I will explore the ways in which the city was framed by preservationists around 1900 and the effects of these narratives about urban spaces. Preserving, I will suggest, was as destructive as demolition. In New Orleans, the early preservationist narrative erased Black New Orleanians' histories from the city's space on multiple levels and also immigrant and working class cultures, ultimately creating the French border as an exclusive space of white aristocratic Creole nostalgia perfectly suited for tourist consumption. This multi-layered history of the St. Louis Hotel in New Orleans will take us first back into the early 20th century, then further back into the antebellum era, and then back into the 1920s. In 1915, a hurricane badly damaged the old St. Louis Hotel on Royal Street in the heart of the French Quarter. It was, had been renamed Hotel, oh, Hotel Royal in the 1890s, and it had served as a luxury hotel until the turn of the century. So here on this Carrie and Ives um, lithograph, you can see um, the location of the hotel. Um, it's, um, I have a detail where you can, you can see it better. You can see um, Jackson Square in St. Louis Cathedral, and then um, I think two or three blocks um, upriver towards Canal Street, you can see the big dome of the hotel. So it is quite a presence there. Um, prior to its demolition, the hotel, however, had been out of business for roughly a decade. So it was basically a ruin. The occasional tourists would venture into that ruin, exploring the remnants of past glamour and homeless people would take shelter for the night. So basically the hurricane of 1915 was a welcome occasion to get rid of this ruin in early 1916. This was not the first time that old structures of the French Quarter gave way to the wrecking ball. The piece by piece demolition of the Vieux Carré, which is a name for French Quarter, that's the old colonial city as laid out by the French colonizers in the 1720s, which you can see here on a 1720s map, and also located here on the banks of the Mississippi River. And so this piece by piece demolition since the roughly the turn of the century um, is in keeping, of course, with, with the progressive era's reform spirit. It translated into white, mainly American, uh, Anglo-American urban boosters attempt at bringing light, air, and progress into the old city's core. For example, in the summer of 1903, the entire block next to the hotel, hotel was raised. So here you can see um, 
the, the block of the hotel where it is called state house here because it temporarily stayed um, after reconstruction state as, uh, served as a state house. And that the block to the left on this map where you can read exchange place, that entire block was raised. I think 50, roughly 50 buildings all in all. In 1909, a new white bazaar style building was inaugurated in its place, like one building on the place of all of these buildings. Um, it um, housed the Louisiana Supreme Court and the Orleans Parish Civil District Court, which I might know this building, it's still standing there today. By its formal vocabulary, that marble building referred to 1893, that magic moment in American urbanism. In that year, Chicago's white city had visualized the ideal pure white and well-ordered metropolis that would henceforth fire the architectural and planning imagination. Similarly, in New Orleans, the new court building was hailed as, as bringing modernity into the old city. A local editorial news, and I quote, a solid block of the old quarter is being torn out by the roots to let sunlight into dark, narrow streets, end quote. At the same time, in what I would call an early type of urban renewal, the courthouse seemed a way of redeeming a neighborhood. In the early decades of the 20th century, travelers were strongly recommended to avoid the French Quarter at night. Since the late 19th century, it had undergone a fundamental change from an important commercial strip around Royal Street and wealthy residential section to a living space for the immigrant poor, primary from Italy. In 1910, 80% of the quarter's residents were from Sicily, with New Orleans dubbing it Little Palermo. The journalist Ethel Hudson sighed, and I quote her, the Vieux Carré now sad to say throughout many of its streets is little better than a slum, end quote. Congestion and darkness were associated in turn with poverty, with sickness, promiscuity, immorality, criminality, and of course with this immigrant population who had like weeds to be torn out at the roots. So the courthouse building is only one example of this modernist strand of urban planning that swept the Crescent City. From the late 19th century up to the 1920s, local politicians and especially business, businessmen united in the New Orleans Association of Commerce tried to clean the city, to drain it, to pave it, to sanitize it, and to tear down parts of the urban fabric that they deemed old and outdated. And they hoped to make the city more efficient and um, more prone to movement to the circulation of air, of goods, of people, all of this in the name of progress against stagnation, like literal progress and movement and literal stagnation, but also metaphorical, of course. Um, to finally, hopefully, live up to the ideal of the new self. If it were for the Association of Commerce, the cast iron balconies that are today iconic for New Orleans would have gone in 1914, and I quote, in the interest of appearance, safety, better light, and ventilation, unquote. Now, while the gleaming court building received enthusiastic support by most newspapers, however, a group of architects voiced criticism and a feeling of loss. In their eyes, the brand new building represented an invasion of the quaint old French Quarter. And some newspapers echoed feelings of sadness, and I quote, to see the picturesque features disappear, end quote. So since the 1890s, architects, artists, art professors, and art students, as well as local women's clubs, united to more or less successfully protest the demolition of famous old buildings, propagating an alternative vision of the city. For them, old didn't mean old fashioned, but quaint and picturesque. Similarly, newness and progress did not necessarily mean improvement, um, but implied a destructive quality. So consequently, members of the Louisiana Federation of Women's Clubs and the American Institute of Architects formed the Committee on Conservation of St. Louis Hotel in 1916 to preserve the structure where, and I quote, the beauty and brilliancy of Creole Dom display their graceful and fascinating charms, end quote. Supported by the Daughters of the Confederacy, the committee sought to raise funds in order to preserve at least the domed lobby of the hotel and integrate it into some new building that would serve some kind of public purpose, for example, a museum or a convention center. <clears throat> they sold postcards, organized guided tours and hosted events where, for example, and I quote, eight young girls in antebellum costume danced a minuet, end quote. Now, all of these endeavors remained unsuccess unsuccessful and the Committee on Conservation urged, and I quote, let us not destroy the fine old buildings our ancestors built, nor discard native architectural forms, end quote. 
So old in this narrative meant fine and quaint, and this again stood for native, for characteristic, and for unique, and not for unhealthy and decrepit. The St. Louis Hotel seemed iconic for that type of quaint history, representative both of the antebellum South and Creole colonial New Orleans, those in a quote, days of chivalry and romance, and quote, as a reader of the Times Picayune remarked. In 1835, the French architect Jacques de Pouilly had been commissioned with a commercial exchange in the Vieux Carré, which opened in 1838. With its arch facade on St. Louis Street between Chargers and Royal, the representative building occupied half a block. At the time, in the aftermath of the Louisiana Purchase, ethnic strife was running high in the city. From 1836 to 1852, New Orleans was divided into three independent municipalities. The, what is, was called the American sector, uptown, the Faubourg of St. Mary, upriver from Canal Street, where many newcomers to the city had settled, had seceded from the city in conflict with the downtown sections, more generally French speaking and Catholic. So, general, that also has a mythic quality to it, but we can talk about that later. The St. Louis Hotel can hence be seen as a Creole or French answer to the luxurious St. Charles Hotel uptown. Both hotels were also the municipality's most important commercial exchanges. Merchants congregated in the hotel's magnificent halls to negotiate deals. Many local merchants boasted an office in the building, out of towners could board in luxurious rooms, dine comfortably and socialize. Extravagant balls attracted the high society of each district. In short, these hotels were the centerpieces of business and elite entertainment. The St. Louis heart was its rotunda, a dome covered lobby surrounded by a row of columns, its walls frescoes. Here, auctions were held. Here, locals and visitors alike could sip drinks and promenade while delving into a rich world of material goods on display from alcohol to coffee to paintings. Every fall, the Philadelphia newspaper explained, the merchants and planters moved to the city with their families to do business and participate in the pleasures of the season." End quote. Now, at the same time, the St. Louis Rotunda was hailed as the South's most important slave market. Since 1808, when the transatlantic slave trade was officially banned, the domestic slave trade boomed, and New Orleans became the hub for this type of interregional trade. All in all, until today, I think 52 places in New Orleans were used as, or have been identified so far as having been used um, as a slave market, but the St. Louis Hotel was the largest. The historian Walter Johnson has minutely described the degrading procedures slaves were subjected to before an auction. Once on the auction block, they became part of yet another spectacle with both prospective buyers and curious visitors gazing at the slaves on the block like at motionless statues as a Northern traveler remarked. The auction block of the St. Louis was a podium framed by columns and arches surmounted, surmounted by a dome surrounded by an abundance of commodities by the hustle and bustle of merchants praising their goods and by leisurely promenaders. In the rotunda, a visitor wrote, and I quote, one auctioneer was selling pictures and dwelling on their merits, and another one was disposing of some slaves. These consisted of an unhappy Negro family, end quote. As the historian Erin Greenwald remarks, and I quote her, there wasn't anywhere else in the country where human beings were bought and sold in such luxurious environments, end quote. In the 1916 campaign to preserve the St. Louis Hotel's Rotunda, its history of slavery was rarely mentioned. Preservationists themselves never alluded to it. At times, editorials romanticized it as a key component of the nostalgic image of the old South. And I quote, um, soon the formerly world famous Old St. Louis Hotel of New Orleans, like the civilization of which it was the business and social center, will be only the memory and theme for the future historical novelist. It not only housed the gay social function in the then, of the then gayest city of America, but it was a scene of some of the greatest slave slave sales ever held in the United States." End quote. Now, this is not surprising for a Southern newspaper. It's the deeply segregated South of the 1910s, and the nostalgia of slavery was an integral part of the myth of the lost cause. Yet the preservationist coalition refrained from explicitly glorifying the slave trade. Still, I think by framing the St. Louis Hotel and the entire Vieux Carré as an icon to a glorious Creole antebellum past, preservationists excluded Black New Orleanian stories on two levels. Now for one, prior to the Civil War, 
the hotel was quintessentially a space of exclusion. Of course, African Americans had physical access to it, yet their very physical access as goods on the block testified to their exclusion from human and citizenship rights. The rotunda visually confronted the material wealth, the elegance and leisurely pursuits of the planter and merchant class with the misery and despair of those sold off as property, visualizing the entanglement of the plantation economy and the market economy. The physical presence of African Americans in this space as goods on the block next to coffee and sugar marked the hotel as a white exclusive space. Even more, it stood as an icon to a lifestyle that was fundamentally based on the subjugation of those sold in its halls. Until the Civil War, the St. Louis would act as the glamorous center of antebellum social life, of antebellum Creole social life. The dome under which business was conducted and slaves were sold was the heart of a non-Anglo-American Creole high society that, like its American counterpart, drew its wealth from enslaved labor. Clamoring for the importance of this edifice and precisely for the preservation of its auction rotunda to remember a better and unique past of the city, preservationists enshrined the object character of African Americans in their narratives of New Orleans' typical space. Postcards printed to commemorate the old St. Louis Hotel and to raise awareness to its impending demolition reinforced this narrative by positioning the spaces of slave sales and even former slaves themselves as object of visual consumption. So this was, for example, also a post postcard the Committee on Conservation had printed to uh, make some money, uh, to raise money, and the caption read, the colored women standing on the block was sold for $1,500 on the same block when a little girl. Now, the second on a second level, the Creole past that was to be preserved in the St. Louis Hotel and in other French Quarter structures was itself located in the, rail, in the realm of the imaginary. It was whitened. After the Louisiana Purchase, the term Creole was primarily used to distinguish those born in Louisiana from those Americans pouring into the, the city from other regions. At the heart of the Creole identity in the early Americanization period was the idea of an origin to the soil used to lay claim to the land and fight potential dispossession. Um, Creole prior to the Civil War hence included also Blacks born in Louisiana. White supremacy was so firmly established in antebellum Louisiana that sub subsuming native born of different races under one term, the term Creole, could not be seen as a threat to white Louisianans. Now, obviously the Civil War altered radically all these settings and insecurities arose within the local white population and to be lumped together in a whatsoever category with non-whites seemed detrimental to white Creoles social and political standing. In these decades after the Civil War, the Creole myth evolved, effectively whitening the Creoles and recasting them as descendants of white French aristocrats. White New Orleanians of French descent, Anglophone New Orleanians, white visitors and nationally known writers like Grace King or Lafayette Hearn contributed to the creation of this Creole mythology, framing Creole antebellum life as a white, cultured, polite and haughty life of grace taking place mainly in the theater, in the opera, in dueling grounds, or at the dining and gaming tables. The space of these mythic people was the Vieux Carré, and this was the place from which New Orleans' uniqueness originated, by way both of its old age and its foreignness. A reporter of the Times Democrat pondered in 1885, and I quote, perhaps there is no city the side of the water that has about it so much of the European characteristics as has the Crescent City. In the older or French portion of the city, this is most marked. And the mayor of New Orleans in 1913, Martin Behrman, pointed out, and I quote, to the Creole quarter especially, there's a foreign aspect. It is as if one had stepped into some old world town and left America with its newness and its harshness far behind. The realm one stepped into when entering the quarter was a realm of supposed aristocratic refinement. This was the glamorous stuff of which the nostalgic vision of the St. Louis Hotel's heydays were made. A myth that conveniently fit with the Southern nostalgia of the lost cause, which was built on the glorification of slavery. By grounding their defense of historic buildings in the Creole myth, early 20th century preservationists perpetuated it as well as the racial anxieties it was based on. 
Uh, even though the St. Louis Hotel was torn down, the very act of whitening the Vieux Carré's past through the way the hotel was framed, I would argue, led to the neighborhood's ultimate preservation from the wrecking ball and created a mythic site for tourist consumption for decades to come. Preservationists, in fact, were able to successfully sell their fantasy of New Orleans history to the city's business elite in the 20s. As a tool of modern planning, New Orleans 1929 zoning ordinance regulated the city's spaces strictly according to their function, like residential, commercial, industrial, etc. Yet, a special historic district zone H was provided for encompassing most of what is today the French Quarter. I don't know if you can read it. So it's all um, functionally separated, um, but there is the special, special Bureau district, special regulations for the greater part of historic district, district mixed use zone H for historic. Um, formally, from then on, the Bureau was hereby defined as special. Based on an amendment to the Louisiana Constitution in 1936, a city ordinance of 1937 empowered the Municipal Commission to regulate private property in zone H. New Orleans was henceforth hailed as one of the first cities next to Charleston to actually create a historic district subject to the preservationist rationale. For the city's urban boosters who had wanted to tear down everything right before, historic preservation became hence conceivable and practical, practicable the moment it became a feature of an encompassing plan, like a practice delimited, limited to a clearly defined zone. Moreover, the whitened past of that specific zone was not a threatening past. White Creoles were no longer in power, and it silenced the violence of antebellum slavery. It erased, erased the racially mixed Creole antebellum past, as well as the con contemporary immigrant realities of the French Quarter. Its special treatment, in short, was grounded in a story of romantic past white foreigners. These were the preconditions for business elites with a predilection for the rationalized modern progressive city to acknowledge the old and the foreign as something potentially interesting for ultimately offering New Orleans difference, its Creole past, as a selling point to the rising tourism industry. To quote the planner Harlan Bartholomew in a city planning report of 1931, and I quote, the Vieux is rich in historical associations replete with romance and exudes an old world atmosphere, which gives it a uniqueness and individuality without parallel." End quote. To conclude then, in a sense, through preservation activism, or precisely through the ways in which architecture was discursively framed in preservation attempts, the French Quarter's diverse past was tamed in the 1920s and incorporated into the urban texture as a zone as a zone of homogeneous past white foreigners that would go on to be the New Orleans tourist attraction. The consensus between the business and preservationist elites that had so bitterly clashed around 1900 was built on a fantasy. That fantasy was enabled by the erasure of both black Creole and African-American history from the memory of the city's built environment. And it enshrined an exclusive imaginary of New Orleans history in the city's urban space for decades to come until today. Thank you.